Shalom, brothers and sisters. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. From Yahuwah the Father and Yahusha our Mashiach, his voice. Hear, O Yasharal. Yahuwah our Mighty One is one Yahuwah. This is Brother David coming to you again to bring you the House of Bondage, and this is part two. I know this took a while to make, but we had to get through the book of Deuteronomy and a few other videos first. Now we're here. I have a lot of questions on the comment board about the videos that are missing. The reason that they're missing is because YouTube has given me a warning after they have deleted the deception of the Jews. They said they don't want any content that they can screw as hate speech. That's just about anything that you can say. Because when you talk about the Jews, brothers and sisters, that's when they come down on you. And I've been speaking about every race, every ethnicity. I leave no one out, especially the Yesharites or the Israelites. Even us, we have to be corrected. The father said, cry loud and spare not. Show your people their transgressions. You cannot cry loud and spare loud, cry loud and spare not on YouTube. Because there's rules, laws. I've been going through the laws. Basically, to tell you the truth, you can get shut down for almost anything. So we have to be careful. If you want some of those videos, if you are interested in them, download what you want now. A lot of them are going to be deleted for the protection of our channel. Now, in House of Bondage, Part 1, we learned that according to the 13th Amendment, you are still a slave if you commit a crime. They actually made a law. Who did they make that law for? The slaves. In House of Bondage Part 2, we're going to speak about another form of slavery. Let's begin. Consumer debt hits $4 trillion. Of course, for any one individual, you have to make sure you are not taking on more debt than you can handle. Do you know anyone today that has this restraint? The average American has a credit card balance of $4,293. According to the latest Experian data, total credit card debt is also at its highest point ever surpassing one trillion dollars the federal reserve found february 21st 2019 very recent did you hear that number we throw these numbers around like they're small a trillion dollars that is a lot of debt brothers and sisters auto loan debt and delinquencies are at an all-time high. The U.S. is at an all-time high for auto loan delinquencies. Is this the sign of overborrowing or overconfidence in the economy's strength? Seven million people are at least 90 days behind in their car payments. That's when they come and take it, right? Three months? according to a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Longer auto loan periods and increased average loan amounts may be another indication that people are overstretched. If you have a longer auto loan period, that means more interest, you'll be paying more for that vehicle. Despite sunny reports about the economy, Total auto debt in the U.S. today exceeds, exceeds one trillion, the Federal Reserve said. 
So you see the brothers running down, riding down the road, brand new Mercedes, brand new Dodge Charger, BMW, status symbols. They're in debt up to their eyeballs. And you may look and say, oh, wow, they're doing good. This person may be 90 days behind in their car payment. U.S. mortgage debt rises to $8.8 trillion. What did you say, Brother David? I said U.S. mortgage debt rises to $8.8 trillion. As of December 31st, Americans are $13.15 trillion in debt. That's $193 billion more than the quarter before. According to the latest data released by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, most of that increase, about $139 billion, has been in mortgage debt. Americans owe a total of $8.88 trillion in mortgage loans. So, you see people have a nice house. And you say, wow, I want to get a house like that also. You will become a part of this $8.88 trillion of debt. How do you get a house in the United States? You have to get a mortgage, right? Who saves the money in advance to pay for the house? No one. You just go out and get a loan. That's just the way this system works. Student loan debt statistics in 2019. A $1.5 trillion crisis, says Forbes. The latest student loan debt Statistics for 2019 show how serious the student loan debt crisis has become for borrowers across all demographics and age groups. Everyone is affected by this. There are more than 44 million borrowers, most of those are young people, who collectively owe $1.5 trillion in student loan debt in the U.S. alone. the house of bondage all right let me show you how this bondage works the child just got out of high school the first thing he wants is a cell phone correct so you go to your carrier AT&T whoever you have and they'll give you a loan for the phone you sign a two year contract by the time you finish, you probably have paid <laughs> more than what the phone is worth. And the next phone has already came out. So now it's time to upgrade to the new one. So they keep you in that cycle, correct? So they get their little job. They go and they get their job in McDonald's. And the first thing that they do is they say, hey, I need a vehicle to get around, right? So the parent tells the child, you can't get a vehicle because you don't have credit. The first thing we have to do is build your credit. So what do you do? Now we have to get you in debt. If you're not in debt, you don't have any credit. The house of bondage. So once the child gets some debt, his credit score starts to go up. If he gets two or three credit cards, that's about 75 points that he can add to his credit score. Then he goes out and he gets a car loan. All right. So, so far, what does he have? He has a phone payment. He has a credit card payment. Now he has a car loan payment. Congratulations. Welcome to the house of bondage. 
welcome to this matrix that they have created to keep you locked down. Now a little time has passed. It's time for this child to go to school. He has to take out a loan, a student loan. Let's just say that he wants to become, you know, he doesn't want just a regular, he doesn't want to be a home health aide or any of that stuff. He wants a real education. He wants to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or, you know, something that has some weight to it where he can get a good salary. So he's going to borrow $100,000. So after he has borrowed this $100,000, what does he have now? He has a cell phone payment. He has a credit card payment. He has a car loan payment. Now he has a loan for $100,000 that after he graduates and gets a job, then he has to start paying on that. The house of bondage. Right out the gate, brothers and sisters, they got you. You are nothing but merchandise in this country. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. For years we have read this passage and we've taught our children how to carry themselves. But one of the things that we missed is that we didn't read context. I want you to read Proverbs 22 for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. We didn't read context about this. When the writer was telling us to train up a child, this is what he was talking about. Verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. This is the context. This is what the writer wanted you to teach your children about debt. When you release your child into this world, into this matrix that we're living in, and you don't teach them about debt, most of their life, they're going to be a slave to this corporation, the United States. The father hates this behavior. The father hates debt and usury. And this country is about usury. Let me show you an instant of what happened in Israel when the children first came back from Babylon. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 1 to 5 And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. This word Jew is not in the book, the translator put it there. It should be Yahudi or Yahuda. Verse 2 For there were they that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Verse 3 some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There was lack. Could have been a famine. But there wasn't enough food and everything to go around. They just came back from Babylon. They were rebuilding the walls. They were rebuilding the temple. Verse 4, there were also that said, we have borrowed money from the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. So they owed, what did they use this 
as collateral, their lands and vineyards. Verse 5. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren. What do you mean by that? And our children as their children. How were their children? And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and daughters to be servants. Listen. Debt is bondage. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Debt is bondage. Look at who were taken into bondage because of the debt. The sons and the daughters. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. How can you redeem them? For other men have our lands and vineyards, the same as it is today in America. The house of bondage. So if you notice, debt is bondage, brothers and sisters. This happened even in ancient Yasharal. When they came back from Babylon, there were some of those who practiced because they learned this usury thing in Babylon. Law Dictionary. A low deal. I want to just give you a few words before we continue. Land held absolutely in one's own right and not of any lord or superior. Land not subject to feudal duties or burdens. An estate held by absolute ownership without recognizing any superior to whom any duty is due on account thereof. Do you own your home? Do you own the land that you have? Is your land free of any duties or burdens or taxes or mortgage online etymology dictionary the word is deed in law written document authenticated by seal of the person whose will it declares especially for the purpose of conveying real estate is from early 14th century as a verb convey or transfer by deed 1806 American English. Did it say anything here that if you have the deed in your hand that you own the property? Do you know what the deed is for? It's for conveying or transferring real estate. What is it? You are the debtor who owns the deed. The deed is so that you can transfer this debt to the next person who becomes the next debtor. So don't think that because you have the deed that you're the owner. Online etymology dictionary and the word is mortgage. Late 14th century. From old French mortgage, literally dead pledge. For mort, dead, plus gauge, pledge. So called because the deal dies when the debt is paid or when payment fails. Do you see how words are broken down? Everything has a meaning. This is why we have to study this English language so that we can know what they put in our book and what they're telling us when you read these contracts, right? So a mortgage means dead, pledge. And they say the reason it's called that is because the deal is done when you've paid off the creditor or when you've missed, what, three uh, payments and you go into foreclosure and they take back the deed and transfer the debt back to themselves. But no one here really owns this property brothers and sisters the creditor doesn't own it 
nor do you. Online Etymology Dictionary. The word is tax. Early 14th century. Obligatory contribution levied by sovereign or government. From Anglo-French tax, Old French tax, and directly from Medieval Latin taxa, from Latin taxer, see tax. If you're being charged a tax by your government or your king, according to the first definition, Elodio, are you the owner of that property? Remember what Elodio said. You shall be free of any duties or burdens or superior whom duty is due. If you have to pay a tax, you're paying the true owner. Have you ever heard this statement? That nothing can be certain in this life except for death and taxes? Now you understand. Now let's return to Nehemiah. Verse 6. And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. This is Nehemiah speaking. Verse 7. Then I consulted with myself. I guess he went into a room and began to talk to himself. And I rebuked the nobles, the rich, and the rulers, the rich, and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. Usury is forbidden in the law. He brought forth the priests, the Levites, the rulers, the elders, had them all sitting down so that they can witness this event. Verse 8, And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, <laughs> Yehuda which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? Then they held their peace and found nothing to answer. It is forbidden to sell your brothers to the heathen. I wonder if they were carrying out this practice. Verse 9, also I said, it is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our mighty one because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? They lost their fear of the mighty one. What came in the way, brothers and sisters? What took control of them? What spirit overcame our people that they were putting our own people into bondage? Usury, profit, the love of money is the root cause of all evil. Verse 10, I likewise in my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. You can get what you're supposed to get when you make your loans. I pray you, Nehemiah said, let us Leave off this usury. Do not charge them interest. Verse 11. Look at the word. Restore. We've been going through these words for the longest, right? And we know that the word, when you put in the front of the word, re, it means return. Return to them, I pray you. Even this day, their lands, 
their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine, and the oil that ye exact of them. If you were to go to the creditors today or to the United States government, and tell them that you need to fear Yahuwah and restore everything that they have taken from you, do you think they're going to do this? Well, they're not our brothers anyway, right? What about their own people? Even the Europeans are in debt up to their ears. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And the Joneses are in debt. Verse 12. Then said they, We will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and I took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Listen, <laughs> Nehemiah. He said, Hold it. Let me get this down on paper. <laughs> This is not going to be a dead pledge. Verse 13. Also, I shook my lap. You know, if you have robes on, you're sitting down at the table and you're eating and some crumbs fall in your lap and you shake it. And said, so the mighty one shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, I agree, and praised Yahuwah. And the people did according to this promise. Where do you want to be? In this house of bondage? They're not going to restore nothing to you. Everything here is about take, take, take. I used to always say this is the land of the fee and the home of the slave. And this was years ago I was teaching about finances in the church. The servant is, I mean, the borrower is a slave to the lender. But in ancient Israel, because we have laws against this behavior, you can't take your brother's property because this is how he's going to eat. You have to restore it to him. You can't charge usury. You are protected in the kingdom. Let me ask you a question. Who's protecting you here in America? Who's got your back here? Do you remember the foreclosure crisis when the economy fell and all these people lost their homes? The economy fell. No one was making money. Um, the businesses were falling to pieces. The banks were not lending money. Who came in to protect you? They just took your home. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19 to 20, just so that you can see the law. Verse 19, thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Key word, your brother. Usury of money usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. That means anything. You can't charge usury. Are the Europeans making this practice to their brothers? I mean, I can see them charging interest to us and charging us usury because we're not their brothers. Basically, we're just slaves and servants here. So yes, they can charge usury to us, but look what they're doing. This is the house of bondage. And in this house, everyone is going to be a slave. Even their own brothers, they're charging usury. This is the big practice here in this capitalist society. Verse 20, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury. So if they lend it to you, it's okay. But when they're charging usury to their own people, something is wrong. But unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. Brothers and sisters, remember this all the days of your life. That Yahuwah, thy mighty one, may bless thee in all thou settest thy hand 
two in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So when we go into the land to possess it, keep this in mind. The practices that you learned in this house of bondage, the practices that you've learned here in this Babylon, you will not take it, take this stuff back into the promised land. Psalms chapter 15, verse five. Let's see the penalty for these actions. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent, such people will stand firm forever. So all of the people who you see that are charging interest, they're finished. The ones who do not will stand forever. Be one of those who shall stand forever. When you lend to your brother, have it in your mind already that you're not going to receive it back. And if you receive it back, you know that, hey, this is a wonderful day, but do not attach to it usury. Listen, it may sound crazy, but the Bible says, this book says, that if you don't charge usury to your brother, Yahuwah will bless you. Proverbs chapter 28, verse eight, he that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. Listen, brothers and sisters, this gathering is coming soon. They got our stuff. We're not talking about paper money. The father says the gold is mine. The silver is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills, it's mine. When he returns, they're going to have to give it to the heirs. Who are the heirs? The children of Yasharal. So don't worry when you see these people riding around in big Rolls Royces, living in mansions, having these tall high rises worth billions of dollars off the backs of usury. Don't you worry about that. Just don't get caught into that trap and that snare of the devil thinking you're going to get rich and the next thing you know, you're impoverished because they're going to take everything from you. There is no laws to protect you here in the United States. This is a capitalist society, which means that one person makes gain on the back of another. I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire and I control the British money supply. That's a quote by Nathan Rothschild. This is the banking cartel. Look, theeventchronicle.com. The Rothschilds family is slowly but surely having their central banks established in every country of this world, giving them incredible amounts of wealth and power. In the year of 2000, there were seven countries without a Rothschild owned or controlled central bank. Look at the countries. Here's your list. Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. In every one of these countries, there's turmoil. It is not a coincidence that these countries, which are listed above, were and are still under attack by the Western media. Since one of the main reasons these countries have been under attack in the first place is because they do not have a Rothschild's own central bank. Look this up yourself, brothers and sisters. The only countries left in 2011 without a central bank owned or controlled by the Rothschilds family are 
Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. Now, when you go to this website, the Event Chronicle, and you look at this, they're going to show you all the list of the countries that have central banks that are controlled or owned by the Rothschilds family. We know these three countries that are left. They're hardliners. Cuba's not having it. But they're playing a game with Cuba right now. Under President Obama, they opened up friendly relationships between Cuba. They allowed trade. And they allowed people to go back and forth into the country. They started building hotels, seaports. They were getting ready so they can start their businesses there. Then comes Trump. Trump closes it off. There's no more of this. You can't have these ships going there. They just built the hotels, the seaports. All of the businesses have lined up. So what they did, they gave them a taste of it. Then they took it away. You know, when you give people a taste of something, then you take it away. They fight for it, don't they? They may be taking the central bank soon. North Korea, that's President Trump's friend, homeboy, rocket man, he calls him. <laughs> now they're talking about letting them keep their nuclear weapons. They'll just have to join their coalition and what? Take on a central bank so they can experience this prosperity also. What about Iran? Iran is not going to have it. Iran is the number one geopolitical foe, as they tell you on the news every single day, because these people will not accept Western values. That's what it's all about. Everyone in the region hates Iran. Everyone in the region has a central bank. All of the Muslim countries, they have central banks. The Israelis, the Saudi Arabians, they are against Iran. They're saying that Iran, they're the ones who are causing all of the terrorists and they're funding the terrorist actions all over the Middle East, the so-called Middle East. Iranians are Shia Muslims. Mohammed bin Salman, and the Saud Saudis, uh, Saudis, they are Sunni Muslims. The Iranians accuse the Sunnis of not practicing a pure form of Islam. Why do they say that? Because they have a central bank and they're taking usury. You won't hear it on the news, but it's true. They do not believe in usury. In the Quran, you cannot take usury. Let's continue to read. After the instigated protests and riots in the Arab countries, the Rothschilds family finally paved their way into establishing central banks. You see these instigated protests? It was called the Arab Spring. You saw it all over the news, right? All of the young people were rising up in these Arab countries. They wanted prosperity like the United States. What do you need to get this prosperity? A central bank. and getting rid of many leaders, Gaddafi, which put them into more power. Now, do you think the event chronicle is making a stretch by making these statements? I don't think so. I think they're right on point because I got some witnesses. I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is now controlled by its system of credit. We are no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men, Woodrow Wilson.
the President of the United States, dated 1919. The Federal Reserve took over the country in 1913. Remember, this is your uh, president of the United States speaking. Now we know in order for a thing to be true, we have to have two or three witnesses. The money powers prey upon the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. The banking powers are more despotic than a monarchy more insolent than an autocracy, more selfish than a bureaucracy. Who is this? One of the presidents of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. You are a den of vipers. You is a pronoun. And thieves. And by the eternal I will route you out. This is the President of the United States, the seventh President, Andrew Jackson, speaking to a group of big bankers in 1834. So the you, the pronoun, is the big bankers. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. One of the presidents of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Was he right? National debt. Twenty two trillion. You see on the top there? This is 2019. Look at all those zeros. We're not talking about a small amount. Not $20. Not $22. $22 trillion. What about public debt? Public debt. $14 trillion. Add them up. $36 trillion. Hold it one second. The public's in debt. The government's in debt. Who are we indebted to? Do you remember the quote from Nathan Rothschild? He doesn't care what puppet sits on the throne. He doesn't care, I'm adding this in myself, what president is elected in the United States as long as he controls the currency, he controls the nation. So the corporation of the United States is an umbrella. You created an, uh, a corporation to cover up those who have the most interests in this corporation. Who do you think that is? Who has interests in this debt? Who is behind these central banks? We're starting to wake up, aren't we? Just alone, brothers and sisters, me giving you this information in this form where it cannot be disputed, <laughs> I'm worthy of death. 
See, we're getting ready to move into a different arena now. I'm going to show facts, information, leave off as much commentary as possible so that you can see. This is America. The land of the fee and the home of the slave. When a person wants to come here, he's saying, I want to put myself in debt. I want to be an American citizen. I'm going to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Who are you pledging allegiance to? The corporation. Who is behind the corporation? You've already seen that. Is this some type of conspiracy theory? Here's the information right here in front of you. If the United States is borrowing money, who are they borrowing from? They're not borrowing it from other countries. It's coming from a central bank that is printing money out of the blue. This money does not even exist. Remember Thomas Jefferson? Inflation, then deflation. At $22 trillion in debt, who owns the land here? The Corporation of the United States. Who owns the people who are in debt? $14 trillion? The Corporation of the United States. Is this the land of milk and honey? <laughs> It is perceived to be by those who are not enlightened. All around the world, everyone wants to come here to be a slave. Now, how do you get out of this? The first step is not to try to keep up with the Joneses. All of the behavior that you've learned here in this country has to be dismissed. Especially if you're going into the promised land, you might as well start practicing now. I am. I don't have credit cards. I don't have car loans. I have a mortgage. Almost paid off. Do I own it? <laughs> no. The corporation owns it. I still have to pay them a leasing fee. When we get into the promised land, what is the father going to give us? The land. He's going to give it to us. It's going to be ours. It'll be separated by lot. Free of any duties. Free of any sovereign. It'll be yours. The only way you can go wrong is to mortgage it because you want to keep these practices like you've learned in this Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Debt is slavery. Now, this is for everyone here in the United States. Every single person here is a slave. And it will always be that way until the Mashiach returns. Ground Zero, the United States of America. I truly believe that it shall be destroyed. In the last days after a thousand year reign, it says that Gog and Magog is going to come against the children of Yasharal once more. It doesn't say anything about America. It even lists the African countries that's going to come. It lists Persia is going to come against us in that after that thousand years when Satan is loose from the bottomless pit. America 
You don't hear about it. Could it be totally destroyed? It could be, because he said, whoever does not bend the knee will be wiped off the face of the earth. Now change your behavior, brothers and sisters. Teach your children about this. It is very important. If you don't, you're putting them out there so that they can become slaves. They're not going to be able to navigate all of this. They just want to be like everyone else. The herd mentality. We have to come out of this way of thinking. Shalom.